Good afternoon. It's my pleasure, privilege, and honor to welcome to the Google campus Swami Dayamrita Chaitanya, Executive Director of the MA Center. The MA Center is a nonprofit based here in San Ramon, California, dedicated to spreading the message of love and compassion spread by Amma, also popularly known as uh, the Hugging Saint. Dayamrita's first name literally means Daya on Amrita, which means compassion and nectar, or someone who sim swims in nectarian compassion. So it's only rather fitting that he has chosen to speak to us Googlers about how compassion can help us become better humans personally and professionally. But that was not how Dayamrita Chaitanya thought his life would go. During undergrad days, he studied physics, and he was very interested in film, so he enrolled for a master's in film technology in the prestigious Film and Television Institute of India. And he thought he would end up becoming a documentary filmmaker, or maybe even better, a Hollywood celebrity. And then in 1983, he met his uh, spiritual teacher, Mata Amritananda Mai, also popularly known as Amma, or the Hugging Saint, a simple fisherwoman who went on to become a very well-renowned humanitarian around the world. And he was struck by her simple message of love and compassion, and serving others through love and compassion. And he was so moved by her message and how she lived this in practice that he gave up his film career to dedicate himself fully to her work, to her humanitarian projects around the world. And in 1993, he was ordained as a monk. And for the last decade, Damrata Chaitanya has been the executive director of the MA Center, where this organization or this nonprofit spreads Amma's message of love and service or compassion and action throughout the Western world. And he's done and led a number of projects here, including projects in Haiti during the earthquake, New Orleans during the New Orleans disaster. So therefore, to talk about how to live compassion on a day-to-day -day basis and how it can transform us inside out, personally and professionally, Please help me welcome to the Google campus once again, Swami Dayamrita Chaitanya. Well, thank you so much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I've been watching some of the uh, online YouTube uh, videos about how Googlers have been doing some compassionate actions. So I might be preaching to the choir, uh, so please uh, forgive me. You know, many of us have uh, discussed and meditated upon the meaning of life. And life uh, by itself is meaningless to some. Yet, one can make a beautiful life by living it meaningfully. And what makes life blossom is how we live and attribute the meaning to it. We spend most of our lives uh, in pursuit of material happiness and fulfillment of desires. And yet, after fulfilling many of it, we still feel the void and lack of contentment. So, as uh, some great people have uh, defined, or tried to define what life is, you know that uh, there's a famous uh, author, W.M. Lewis, he said, the tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon, but that we wait so long to begin it. And uh, there was another great salesman, and he said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything that they ever dreamt so that they can see that's not the answer. And the most beautiful quote comes from the famous Indian poet, Rabindranath Tagore, and he said, the most important lesson that man can learn from life is not that there is pain in this world, but it is possible for him to transmute it into joy. So while we ponder about the solution to the modern day problems, everybody agrees that compassion is the perfect solution. And what is compassion? In, uh, I mean, there are so many defi definitions to it, but uh, just uh, very simply, if we put it, it's love 
plus action is compassion. And my, you know, my master, Amma, she says that there are two types of poverty in, world, in the world today. The poverty due to the lack of material wealth and the poverty due to the lack of love. And if we solve the second one, which is the poverty due to the lack of love, you know, naturally the first one also will be solved. And we have, in one sense, we have role models for everything today. A great football player, a great scientist, a great movie star. What we lack is a role model for a great compassionate person. And while we talk about love in this world, you know, most of us, most of the love that we experience in the world today is selfish love. You know, few people know how to love selflessly. Now, we love the cow because it gives us milk. And as long as it gives milk, it, we will love it. And the moment it stops giving milk, you know, we do not hesitate to send it to the butcher. And the love also that we have for one another and for the worldly objects are like this. It uh, reminds me of a story. You know, a woman <coughs> you know, accompanied by her, her husband went to the doctor's office. And after his checkup, the doctor called the wife into the office alone. And he said, your husband is suffering from a very severe disease combined with horrible stress. And if you don't do the following, your husband will surely die. And each morning, you have to fix him a healthy breakfast, be pleasant and make sure that he's in a good mood. And for lunch, make him a nutritious meal and for dinner, prepare an especially nice entree for him. And don't burden him with chores as he probably had a hard day. And don't discuss your problems with him. It will only make his stress worse. And most importantly, you should satisfy his every whim and let him unburden his problems unto you. And he should have no stress. And, he's, and also, be specially loving and affectionate towards him. And if you can do this for the next 10 months to a year, I think your husband will completely regain his health. So as uh, the wife went to the doctor's office alone, you know, the husband was curious. So on the way home, the husband asked his wife, what did the doctor say? So the wife just replied very coolly, he said, you're going to die in 10 months. <laughs> so what does selfless love mean then? You know, we grow in the dark uh, about this while we have such stark examples of selflessness uh, right in front of our eyes. You know, we have not become aware of such examples. If you look at nature, it's serving us without asking anything in return. 24-7. And even while cutting down a tree, uh, it gives us shade and protects the person who is cutting it down. And it's thanks to nature that our lives are sustained and we have fresh air to breathe and pure water to drink and the temperatures are sustained so that it does not affect life here on earth. And yet we abuse and exploit nature though nature gives selflessly without expecting anything in return. And compassion and selflessness go hand in hand. Only if we have selflessness does compassion work. Compassion is also love without expectation. A compassionate person does not expect even a thank you from the person to whom they have offered their help. And we have different degrees of love and compassion is the highest and the purest form of love that a human being can practice in day-to-day -day life. It is recognizing that the person as a part of the sum and your whole being and not looking at them as separate from you. So what is the difference between helping someone and being in compassionate service to them? Now, while helping somebody, you know, always place yourself in a higher pedestal 
and the person whom you are helping in a lower one. And uh, knowing that they need your help. Whereas in a compassionate service, you place this other person in the same level or you place them even a higher level and serve them. So why should we practice compassion in our personal and professional life? Now, as you are already aware, you know, a compassionate person is, is more productive. He brings happiness not only to himself, but to others too. And mind you, there is a difference between a compassionate person and a happy person. You know, a happy person is one uh, who feels temporarily fulfilled and content. Whereas a compassionate person is one who does not care about temporary happiness that is brought through the fulfillment of material and emotional desires. And no amount of material wealth can bring contentment also. You know, just uh, think about, you take the uh, two richest people in this world. You know who they are. Uh, like the two, who are the two richest person on the uh, Forbes list? Bill Gates. Bill, Bill Gates is the first one, and the second one is, no, uh, Carlos, yeah, Carlos Slim. And uh, Bill Gates has an asset which is uh, equal to about 160 billion. And Carlos Slim, uh, who is you know, from Mexico, he has an asset worth about 150 billion. And last year, actually Carlos Slim was the, the most wealthiest because he had 170 and Bill Gates had 150. And now, now he has been promoted or demoted to the second rank. So just think how he'll he feel when he compares himself with Bill Gates. Will he feel rich or poor? Because he has only 150 billion instead of 160, which is, which, you know, Bill Gates has. So in one sense, what, you know, what makes us rich is not the amount of uh, uh, material wealth, but what we have is uh, the, that, as I said, from the contentment that gives from the giving and not from what we receive. And uh, how do we practice this in our daily life? You know, just uh, simple things like take a vow daily that you'll do one good deed a day. Uh, so, or if you, when you come into the office and sit at your dis desk, you know, most people think about the work that is piled on their desk, right? And, and they don't rarely stop and tend to look around at the person sitting next to them and ask them how they are doing uh, or if they are having a difficult day. In a, a big smile makes a huge difference. And while going back home also, you know, you can practice compassion in your daily lives. You know, my spiritual master gives the example of a surgeon who goes to the hospital and does so many surgeries on people, saving many lives, and then goes back home. And what if he behaves like a surgeon at home also? You know, what if he starts cutting open his children or doing something, to, you know, started doing something to his wife. So in our day-to-day -day lives, we have to take so many different roles. And choosing the role which is most beneficial to the other person is also compassion. And sometimes, you know, you might ask this question, you know, I have to be strict and I have to be stern to people. And what will I do at that time? So definitely, you know, that is also, we have to see that it's also another form of compassion. You know, like, uh, uh, you know, once uh, my, a person asked, uh, went to uh, my spiritual master and said, you know, he's, he has written a book. What should he do with this book? So, the, so my master said, you know, just go and give it to this such and such person. And uh, he, she will read the book and give, and give you suggestions as to how the book will be. And after she read the book, she was also a disciple. And she, she, what she said was, she looked at the person straight on his face and said, you know, this book is of no quality. And what you have written is rubbish. But what happened was, uh, you know, the 
Of course, the man should have had a heart attack. But instead, the man took it very humbly. And he completely rewrote the book, which became a bestseller later on. So it's also compassion, it's also discrimination as to what the person whom you are serving needs at that moment to hear. And also, helping nature is also compassion. Do something which is good for nature. Yeah, uh, my master of, often tells people to just grow vegetables at their home. And uh, just getting good food. And then it's not only good for the uh, nature, it's good for us also. And instead of, um, also we should think about uh, why that action is always a part of compassion. So we should try to act and do something. So when we ask this question, what is the greatest benefit of compassion? And why should you do this? Why should you do practice this every day? Because whatever you give, it comes back to you naturally. You know, uh, there's a beautiful story. Once there was a, uh, a lady doctor who was uh, driving on a freeway. And that it was a dark night, and it was a very rainy night. It was very cold. And suddenly, her uh, car got stalled. And she pulled over. She was lucky to pull over to the side. And as she was waiting there, uh, she called the AAA. And the AAA said that uh, it will take at, at least half an hour for the, uh, probably to, to two hours for them to come. And it was, busy, it was a very busy night. And a lot of people had uh, requested for so many calls. So they said probably it will be anywhere close to two hours. So as she was standing there, uh, you know, there were so many cars zooming by, and no, not even one car did stop. And finally, after 45 minutes, one car stopped. And as she was looking at her rear view mirror, she saw a big guy just getting out of the car. And uh, uh, he was coming, walking towards her car. And the moment she saw him, you know, she started getting nervous. And the first thought that went into her mind was this. Was this person uh, knew that I'm alone and I'm a lady, and then might be he wants to rob me, take away all my possessions. But as uh, he came nearer, you know, uh, he just gently knocked on the, on the window. And as she opened the window, he asked her, ma'am, you know, what happened to you? Can I help you in any way? And she said, oh, I called AAA. And he said, look, I know what it is. You know, tonight is a rainy night, and there's so many demands. It might take you two to two and a half, three hours. They say two hours, but it might take three hours. But I'm, a, you know, I'm a mechanic, and I will try to see what's wrong with your car. So reluctantly, the lady agreed. And then he said, you know, why don't you do something? You've been your car doesn't even start. Why don't you go and sit in my car? And you can just sit there in, the, in my car comfortably. So the lady, the next thought that came into the doctor's, lady doctor's mind was, oh, now I know why. He wants to steal my car and go run away with it. And he wants to give me his old Toyota. So then as... She was debating whether to go or not. Finally, she conceded, and she went to the next car, his car, and sat there. And half an hour later, you know, the, the car began running. Her car began running. And the man came back and told her, now your car is running. But one thing, just make sure you just go straight home. And tomorrow morning, you can take it to the mechanic. But please don't drive any further, because I'm not sure whether the car will run further. So as she was going back home, you know, she started thinking, you know, why did I doubt this person unnecessarily? You're such a nice person. And the other thing what she was doing was also, she, as she was about to go, you know, she started offering him some money. And he said, no, 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 there's no need for money. I didn't do it for that. And I don't want any money from you. Just uh, don't worry about it. So as she was driving home, she was started thinking, why did he do this? Why did he do this action? 
So what left was, uh, you know, it left her pondering for two weeks as to why he did it. And then she could not sit quiet unless she returned that favor to somebody else. So she was looking for an opportunity to do something to somebody else. And it was two weeks later, as she was sitting in a, a, a restaurant, and she saw the, there was a, a waitress who was serving there. She was clutching her stomach, and she was running around and doing things. And uh, as she, when she saw her, you know, she was immediately reminded of this person and said, you know, I should, I should try to do something to her. So she went and asked her what her problem was. And the waitress said, look, you know, I have a, I've, I'm supposed to deliver a baby. And my, we don't have an insurance. And my, must, my husband has gone to bring some money and to pay so that I can get admitted in the hospital. And I don't have any money. And uh, so I'm waiting, just waiting for my husband. Meanwhile, I'm having all these convulsions. So I don't know what to do. So the lady doctor said, you please come with me immediately. I will take you to my hospital, and I will deliver the baby myself. Don't worry about the money. Just come with me. So meanwhile, as they were going, you know, the, the lady, the waitress, called her husband and told her that you know, there was a kind doctor who took her to the hospital, and it's such and such a hospital. So he should just come there. And uh, the doctor delivered the baby, and after two, three hours later, the husband rushed inside the room to uh, happily see the mother and the baby. And uh, after uh, you know, having the moments with, the, with the, her, his child, he suddenly started thinking about you know, how he was going to pay back for all the service that was rendered. And uh, he, he was uh, about to get up and run, and then he asked his wife, look, you know, I don't know how to pay for all these services that has been given to us. What should I do? So the wife smiled and said, you know, the doctor said there was no need to pay. And she has paid everything. So the, the husband was so surprised, and he asked her, oh, you know, who is that doctor? I want to meet her. Let me go and meet her. Just tell me her name. So it was at this moment the doctor walked into the room. And both of them just looked at each other and just stopped for a moment. And tears were running out of their eyes. You know who it was? It was the same lady doctor that he had helped earlier. So you know, when, when we are young, you know, we dream of accomplishment. We want to be innovators. We want to be champion great causes. It hardly occurs to us to practice the smaller steps uh, of connection along the way. You know, one kind word, one considerable action, a considerate action on a daily basis will broaden our experience, our understanding, and perhaps even our opportunities to reach our more lofty goals. And so what we have to practice is, a, is, a, is a, in baby steps is a kind action, a kind word, a kind deed. You know, it's a, like this story of the, a man who was walking along a deserted beach at sunset. And as he walked, he could see a young boy in the distance as he drew new, nearer. He noticed that the boy kept bending down, picking something up and throwing into the water. Picking, and time and time again, he kept hurling things into the ocean. And as the man approached even closer, he was able to see that the boy was picking up starfish that had been washed on the beach. And one at a time, he was throwing them back into the water. The man asked the boy what, what he was doing. And the boy replied, you know, I'm throwing these washed up starfish back into the ocean, so, or else they will die through lack of oxygen. But the man said, look, you can't possibly save all of them. There are thousands on this beach. And this must be happening on hundreds of beaches along the coast. You can't possibly make a difference. 
And the boy looked down, frowning for a moment, then bent down to pick up another starfish. Smiling as he threw it back into the sea, he replied, Now, I made a huge difference to that one. So, I'll just uh, stop with uh, one of my favorite quotes by Ralph uh, Waldo Emerson, the great poet. And he, and he said, the purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be a compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. Thank you. Your story of the mechanic and the doctor, that's not bound to happen. So uh, what is it that uh, comes around that uh, is bound to happen? No, that's actually a true story. Yeah, but it will not happen in, in a million years again or, or in a thousand no, years no, that's again. That's why, I, I mean, I just uh, as an example, what I said was uh, whatever give you give, it comes back to you in one form or the other. So uh, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to sell compassion <laughs> in one way. <laughs> uh, like you are all trying to sell so many products here, I'm trying to sell compassion. That's my job. Uh, uh, <laughs> so I, I was doing that, and just I'm, by doing so, I'm just saying through this, uh, illustrating through this story, that it is bound to happen to you when you help somebody, uh, or when you, you know, you will definitely get help from some or some other person, totally unknown. And I've seen this again and again a thousand times. So it, I, I'm sure that it'll come back. That's what I meant. But then it's not selfless. No, but when it becomes selfless when you don't expect it to come back. But what I'm saying is, uh, uh, you know, when you do it without expectation, definitely it will come back to you. I'm wondering, I mean, I, I certainly doing good deeds, you know, on a daily basis, even small ones, is um, a way to practice compassion. I'm wondering, are there any, like, any other ways that you can really practice it to get yourself in a, to have that awareness, to, to make it a habit to do that? See, most of the time what happens is, uh, you know, we are thinking about ourselves, not the other person. You know, uh, I've seen my, my master who's an embodiment of compassion. You know, like one time uh, she, you know, she sits and hugs people. And one time what happened was uh, as she was hugging one person and uh, he was about to get up, suddenly, you know, he just got up inadvertently and went and hit her head. And both their head went and hit each other. And usually you know what happens when our heads get hit. You know, the first reaction is, you know, our hand goes and covers our head and starts rubbing it. And what I saw was, instead of covering her own head, she, she went and started rubbing his head. She didn't think about her, herself. So most of the times that's what happens to us, you know, like we are in a place where we think about ourselves and not about the other person. So what you can just start doing is an exercise by when you are with somebody else, think about what they want or what they would like to be. And uh, how can you help, them? I mean, in one sense, give them some kind of things or do something to them which will make them their lives a little more happy. I was interested in what you said about how if we solve the poverty of love, we solve the poverty of material goods as well. And I believe that, but I also believe that being in a place of privilege where you have enough material goods, maybe that makes it easier to be compassionate and to think about these issues. And I'm just wondering what you think about the relationship between taking care of people materially and taking care of people in terms of teaching them compassion. No, of course, you know, we have to take care of people materially. I'm not saying that, but uh, from a, you know, just a wider perspective, that's what uh, I was just saying, that uh, if we have love, I mean, first of all, we have to have love for what we are doing or for what we are giving it to them. And uh, 
And it it's also starts with compassion to them. That's why we are giving. Otherwise, uh, you know, you would think, you know, why don't I just go and see a movie or go to the bar? Why should I just spend my time uh, doing something for the other person? You know, I'm wasting my time. So unless and until you have that kind of a compassion and love, then it's not going to materialize into action. So that's what I was saying. That definitely, uh, I'm not saying that you should not do it material-wise because, of course, you know, you, uh, there is a famous uh, Indian, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Vivekananda Swami. You know, he said, you cannot talk uh, uh, spirituality to a, a hungry person. Because the first thing that you need to feed is hunger. And you, you should not talk to him. You should not give an advice without feeding his, him first. So it's like that. So you have to take care of their physical needs, definitely. I just had a question on, so it even kind of forms for the first question. A lot of people just tend to be very, very logical, and they end up being a little bit skeptical of some of the stories you tell. What have you seen in your own journey that really helps kind of connect with people like that, that may just be, oh, that's very, very improbable, or that won't really happen? How can you really share the message with them if they kind of take a much more skeptical view versus somebody who may be more open-minded to the spirituality and mindfulness? Uh, it's a good question. But uh, you know, first of all, um, we have to be convinced about what we are talking about. And, and we have to come from the heart and not from the head. And it's not just an intellectual uh, analysis of what I'm telling you today. This is also my experience. I'm sharing you my experience after having uh, been with so many people, after having served so many people. And these stories come from experience, my own experience, and, and from the heart. And if, you don't, if it doesn't come from the heart, you know, it, you cannot convince people if it's coming from the head. And the second thing is, uh, uh, as I said uh, earlier, you know, uh, it, uh, people are, you are right, people are always skeptical. But when you tell them with an open heart, and if they are ready to hear with an open heart, there is always a small opening there. And they might think, oh, perhaps there is some truth to what you are saying. So you, you have to give them a chance. Definitely you have to give them a chance to open their heart and uh, widen their horizons of their heart. So you, you have to have that faith uh, that they, one day or the other, they will have a small opening where they will be able to listen and then be able to pour themselves out and do something. So if you're persistent, you have a chance of catching them at the right time. Right. Hello, um, I'm Igor, and I have a question about expectations. So you mentioned that it's important to avoid expecting some outcome or something that comes back. So I know about myself and about some other people that a lot of people actually feel that something is missing, we want this, we're missing that. Any tips on how to avoid expectations about how to avoid expecting a return, something in return? Uh, correct me if I'm not answering you properly. Um, I mean, there's a beautiful verse in Bhagavad Gita where Lord Krishna says, uh, you know, you should do your action uh, and don't worry about the result. So without expecting the result, you're not going to do an action, correct? And, uh, uh, you know, but the thing is, uh, you know, I'll tell you an example of this, uh, that like, for example, you're going to, a, to meet a friend and uh, ask him for some money because you are in need of money. So you want like $2,000, correct? So um, what happens is, I'm just saying an example, and uh, what happens is uh, he can give you $2,000, or he can give you, sometimes he's, if he's in a very happy mood, he says, oh, take $4,000 and don't worry, don't return it. Or the other thing is he can say, like, you know, I have only $1,000, I don't have money. Or he can say, you know, I was going to come to you and ask money from you. 
correct? So there are different scenarios. So when you talk about expectation, you know, uh, we have to, what I'm saying about is uh, uh, expectation without, when selfless expectation means expectation, thinking about the possible outcomes. So what happens is the, the beauty of that is because whatever outcome that comes, you're not you know, uh, depressed or you're not crying, you're not worrying about it, about what the outcome is because you already know that you're already expecting what the expectation would be. So it's kind of a, just trying to understand what, what will be the results of your expectations. It's not, I'm not saying that you should not have expectations. So just have an awareness that whatever expectation, uh, you know, this, the, there are different forms of results to that. So I'll, I'll just uh, do a very quick two, two to three minutes. Uh, so kindly sit straight. And uh, before you close your eyes, uh, try to look at, at the ceiling or just have a vacant stare. And uh, slowly try and become aware of your breathing process inside and whatever is happening inside the body. And uh, just try to follow each and every inhalation and exhalation that occurs within. And try to breathe normally. And as you slowly and slowly breathe and become aware and more and more aware of your breath and the process, your eyes will slowly close without any effort from your part. And then you feel completely relaxed. and slowly start feeling a light, a ray of light inside your heart, which is the center of the body, not the physical heart, but the spiritual heart. And as the light slowly starts spreading, and filling your whole being. Imagine that you're being filled with love, with bliss, with peace, with compassion. And feel each and every cell in your body being filled with that light. and feel every cell reverberating with love, with peace and with compassion. And imagine <clears throat> your whole being completely immersed and just becoming one with that light. And only the light exists. And now visualize the light going from your heart towards the whole world, to all the beings in this world, to the nature, just like the rays of the sun. And imagine this light, just like the rays of the sun, going out to all the beings. And as the light falls on each and every being, 
Imagine they also become more loving, more peaceful, and more compassionate. And imagine this whole world and this whole universe to be filled with that light of love, peace, and compassion. And with that, I'll close out this session. I wanted to once again thank uh, Swami Dayamrita Chaitanya, both for the work he does in the world, his humanitarian work, and his message of compassion, and for taking the time to come to explore this topic with Google. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you. Yes, thank you.